fall, or spring, or winter, or something. I don't, don't feel like July, but anyway, we're glad you're here tonight. You're a dedicated Baptist because you got out of the sprinkle and came on, you know. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're, we're glad that you came in the shower of rain this evening. Uh, the big event happening this week, and the most important event in any of our lives this week, is what's happening in God's house, revival meeting. I don't know how many of you worked in the daytime. Uh, you have an excused absence if you are at work tomorrow. However, if you can take your lunch hour early, uh, come at 11 o'clock and uh, we'll, either if he ain't through, you can leave if you have to before 12. So anyway, just it'll be an informal kind of day tomorrow. So come if you, at all possible, can come to our day service 11 o'clock in the morning and again tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Now don't get it mixed up. Uh, and come at 7 in the morning and 11 tomorrow night. If you do, I won't be here, okay? Uh, but it's be, be 11 in the morning and 7 tomorrow evening. Now, I don't know about you all, but I felt when I left you this morning, I'd been to a revival. Uh, I, God's word was preached, and the message got my attention, and I had to do some repenting. I'll be honest with you. I'll just confess that to you. Uh, you're you're going to probably want to think, now, preacher, what did you have to repent of? I'm going to do like he did. And this morning, he said, you know, I, that's my bed. It's what I had to repent of. <laughs> you know, uh, it might be more exciting to hear my confession. In fact, I've heard some unusual confessions in revival meetings. You'd be surprised if some of the places I've been, they've had testimonial times and all that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, I'm not going to share that with you tonight because if I get you tickled, you might not. Well, you, he can get you back. I probably couldn't get you back. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, we've had some great times. So you come. If you miss any of the services, you'll miss the very best time of the entire week. And like I mentioned this morning, Brother Braxton's uh, schedule is a very full schedule, and he's not going to be with us the uh, Friday, Thursday, and Friday. And I don't really know how to put this. I don't, I'm not going to say we're going to update, but we're going we're gonna to change things around a little bit. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm, getting up, I'm glad you said that. We get an upgrade. Uh, we're bringing in the senior hunter, uh, Brother Harold Hunter, is coming the last part of the week to be with us on Thursday and Friday. He, too, has a very busy schedule, so remember many your prayers. Uh, not only pray for Brother Harold as he drives down here, but pray for everybody else on the road because I've read the road with him, you know. Uh, 
one time when we were whenever we were at McMinnville, Tennessee, neighbor pastors, he was driving Volkswagen Beetles. And I thought of this today when they had it on the news that the last Volkswagen Beetle rolled off an assembly plant down in Mexico. First thing that came to my mind was the time I rode with Brother Harold Hunter from McMinnville, Tennessee to Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm talking about the back way. I ain't talking about the main highway. He went every pig path and every crooked road and every mountain trail between McMinnville and, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, they didn't have truck lanes to pass on hills, but he passed anyhow. I mean, that, that, we got to Chattanooga, and it was almost a brand new bug. And we stopped and ate dinner, and we got, came out of the restaurant, and I was bragging on what a beautiful car this thing was and how good it rode. Of course, you know, Lord forgive me, but I said, Lord, you know, Brother Harold, I've always wanted to drive one of these things. Let me drive it around the block. Uh, so anyway, he let me drive that thing around the block, and that block lasted all the way the main highway back to McMinnville. I wouldn't even <laughs> slow down because I knew he wanted to drive. But anyway, he drove up there, and I drove back. Uh, but I never did forget that trip. We we made a lot of great times together. Uh, the the best thing I remember his dad pulling was when he was at McMinnville, Tennessee. The Bobby Branch Church of Christ was right up the road. What a heck! You wasn't even born then, so you don't know. Uh, but anyway, it was it was right up the road from from Northside Baptist. And Brother Harold was on the radio every day. I mean, he was on the uh, W A K I McMinnville, Tennessee. Uh, and he was on the radio with, with a program every day. And the Bobby Branch Church, somebody in that church was having a wedding. And the minister from the Bobby Branch Church of Christ called Brother Harold and wanted to know if they could borrow a piano for the wedding. And Brother Harold, of course, he said, yes, sir, you can, and, and we'll deliver it. So he calls one of his men right quick, said, bring your pickup. He said, what, what's the hurry? He said, the church of Christ wants to borrow our piano, and we're going to tear it over to them for the back out, you know. <laughs> So anyway, they carried it over and put it in the fellowship hall of the Bobby Branch Church of Christ. Well, Brother Harold gets up on the radio the next day and he announces that Northside Baptist Church has loaned its piano to the Bobby Branch Church of Christ. And if there's any other churches of Christ in the area want to borrow a piano, that Northside would be glad to furnish it for them, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Church of Christ minister didn't last long after that. <laughs> he had to leave town over there because everybody that saw him laughed at him, you know, about it. Brother Harold's, well, you'll meet him. You'll meet him. If you haven't met Brother Harold Hunter, you're in for a treat. But don't try to outsmart him. I'm telling you, he's the wittiest guy <clears throat> I ever rode in with in a Volkswagen bug. But I outsmarted him one time and drove home. So anyway, uh, and I don't know why I'm telling you all all this stuff, but anyway, welcome to the revival meeting. Our, our plate offering, love offering this morning in the, in the worship service goes to support our evangelist and evangelistic team. Uh, we'll do the same thing tonight. We'll take up another offering. We'll sing a song, and the ushers will come at the end of this next song, and we'll take up another love offering to help uh, support the expenses of the revival meeting and show our appreciation for those who will be bringing God's word to us tonight. I remind you again, we had to go look up the offering plates. If you, uh, if you don't understand the story behind the offering plates, these were made by the, one, of the, one of the men in Belize, Central America, in appreciation for the support of Corinth Baptist Church for the mission work that takes place in, in that Central American country. Uh, each one of these offering plates represents about a week of labor of love uh, by a gentleman in Belize, Central America, in appreciation of, of your support for the Lord's work in Central America. They're a little heavier than normal offering plates because uh, they are made of native wood from Belize, Central America, handmade. And uh, God has a way of reminding us of his work and the spread of his word, not only in the medical mission, the vacation Bible school team that just left, uh, but the radio ministry at Independence and all the other things that are going on as a result of your love, your caring, and your sharing. Okay? All right, with that, we'll sing another song, and then we'll do the offering. If you will, grab your hymnal, please. Let's turn over to number 84. Have just a little talk with Jesus. Lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It made my heart in love and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Talk with Jesus. 
sin may rise and hide the starry skies. But just a little talk with Jesus clears away. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry. So lead us in our offertory prayer, please, sir. The most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the beautiful Lord's Day that you've allowed us yes. to come to my house, Father. We ask you to be with Brother Braxton as he leads us in the message that you've laid upon his heart, Father. May that we put in our hearts and live by it. Father, yes. we ask you to be with this offering that we're about to take up, Father, and may it go further than thy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing hymn number. Victory in Jesus, number 92. 92. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me
Thank you. You may be seated. to be here say amen. amen I'm glad you're all here as well and I enjoyed hearing all these stories about my father that I didn't know before um, he drives like an old man now so I'm glad to hear there was a time where he had a little more pep in his step and I enjoyed hearing about all the confessions that we could make at revival you know he said I'm not going to confess that ain't none of y'all's business what I had to confess I was preaching in South Carolina one time near Myrtle Beach and we had a revival in a church with probably about 1500 people there and a woman came forward at the end of the service and she literally laid two packs of cigarettes on the altar she said i'm giving it up i've tried and i've done everything else and i'm laying these cigarettes on the altar and she made a big speech to the church you know testifying about how this was for real and she was going to give it up and so me and the pastor stood around till everybody was gone you know and after the whole service was over we went out to the parking lot and the only car left in the parking lot was hers and she was standing out next to her car smoking a cigarette and he went over and he said, Lori, what in the world has happened? You just laid your cigarettes on the altar. She said, I forgot I had a pack in my car. <laughs> Did you know there's probably something to that? Whatever you lay on the altar this week, metaphorically or literally, uh, you need to realize that it needs to be completely gone out of your life, isn't it? Uh, take your Bibles with me this evening and open it to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. While you're turning there, I want to say a few words to set the tone for the evening. There is an object that you will find almost anywhere in the world today. You will find this object in this county. You'll find it in your homes, some of your homes. You'll find it where I live and floating along in the Ohio River, which happens to be one of the most contaminated rivers in the United States. But you'll also find it in very beautiful places. You'll find it all around the world. In fact, 
Sometimes when we go to unreached people groups who have never heard the gospel of Jesus, they already have this product. This product to which I'm referring is the Coca-Cola can. How many of you already today have enjoyed some kind of a Coca-Cola product? Raise your hands. How many of you prefer a Pepsi to a Coke? Raise your hands. Okay, sir, God will forgive you of that, Brother BJ. That's, um, as Brother BJ raised his hand back there. God will forgive that, Brother. That's not natural. But, um, but, but I've thought about this. Why is it that Coca-Cola products are everywhere in the world today? And after doing a lot of philosophical and theological reflection, I have come to the conclusion that it's because someone way back in the Coca-Cola company did a fantastic job of reaching all of us with the message that you've got to have the contents of that little red can. And what that led me next to think was that the world does a wonderful job of reaching all of us with their products, don't they? Coca-Cola does a great job of that. Pepsi, apparently, does a great job of that. Walmart certainly does a great job of that. Uh, McDonald's, you can tell by looking at a lot of us, does a great job of that. The world does a great job of reaching us with the products and services that they offer. But unfortunately, we in the church often do a sorry job, a lackluster job, of reaching the world with what it is that we've got, the message of the cross. And so tonight, I want to share with you three things that every good salesperson ought to have that every believer ought to have. Three things that every good salesperson ought to have that every believer ought to have. Now... There are certain people in the crowd who are consider themselves theologians, and what I mean by that is smart Alex. and they'll say something that's like, that doesn't sound spiritual, preacher. I mean, you're going to use salesman terminology to refer to these sacred things of God? Well, now just hold your horses, because I'm actually trying to correct a 2,000-year-old problem that arose in this very passage where a man thought that he could purchase the Holy Spirit of God with money, and you can't do that, can you? And also I want to say as we begin that I'm preaching both to saved folks and maybe lost folks tonight. I recognize on a wet night, stormy night like we're having tonight, that uh, perhaps the people that are the most devoted, as the pastor said, are the ones that hear. And by the way, I don't know who normally comes on Sunday night and who doesn't, so don't think I'm picking on you. But those of you that don't typically come on Sunday night, doesn't it feel good? I mean, doesn't it feel good to be in church? Maybe try that out next week too and see how it goes. But I'm preaching both to saved and lost. Primarily, I'm preaching to the church tonight. But if there is a person here tonight in the sound of my voice that recognizes during the preaching of the gospel that you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then the best thing that could happen tonight is that a lost person come to know Him in our meeting. You know, one of the most difficult things to preach about in the South, the, one of the most difficult things about preaching in the South is that everybody, just about everybody, has had some kind of a church experience They've gone down an altar, they went to VBS, they got baptized, something, and because of that they think they're saved. So you've got to get people unsaved before you can get them saved. And by that I don't mean make them doubt. But I do mean impress upon them that rituals don't make you saved. Walking with Jesus, knowing Jesus, repenting of your sin, that's what makes you saved. Anyway, let's get started. Look with me at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 it says these words. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Now stop right there and look this way. Now are you all listening? Say we're listening. We're listening. Come on, say we're really listening. We're really listening. Okay, calm down. I believe you. I want you to know that in this passage we see the first thing that every good salesperson and every believer ought to have. This is the first great persecution of the church. And now after that persecution, they have begun to spread. And it tells us something interesting when it tells us about how they spread. Look back at verse 4 again. Verse 4 says, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went most places, but not everywhere, preaching the word. Is that what it says? No, it says they went everywhere preaching the word. Now, I will say this, in chapter 11 of the book of Acts, we find out that the, the, the people, the Jews that spread out at first, were only preaching to Jews, but that all changed. Do you know that ultimately, the fact that you've got a Bible in your lap right now, the fact that you know the gospel message in Darden, Ten I'm in Darden, Tennessee, right? In Darden, Tennessee, in North America, 2,000 years later, ultimately goes back to this very moment when the gospel began to spread because of this persecution. But what I principally want you to recognize, are you still listening? Say, we're still listening. A, a rainy night can, can cause you to go to sleep, and that's okay. You can roll over and go back to sleep in a minute, but I want you to get this. 
that they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Ultimately, the church saw that everybody needed Jesus. Every kind of person needed Jesus. The first thing that every good salesperson ought to have, that every believer ought to have, is you've got to have a prospect. Now, do you folks know what a prospect is? Nod your head. Do you know what a prospect is? A prospect is someone you're trying to reach with whatever it is that you've got that you know they ought to have. That's your prospect. Every business has got a prospect. Every believer has got a prospect. Who's our prospect? Everybody's our prospect. Every person needs Jesus. But the church doesn't operate that way. You say, now, well, hold on a second, Brother Braxton. What do you mean we don't operate that way? Why, didn't you just hear just a few moments ago that our very offering plates were made in Belize by someone who we're reaching in one way or another through medical missionaries? Listen, I think that's wonderful. And because this is a Baptist church, you've no doubt given to missionaries through the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention and the North American Mission Board, which does evangelism and missions within North America. I mean, there's no question that financially, the people in this room have made sure that every kind of person hears the gospel, if in no other way, by giving financially of yourselves. But you know, I think there's something more to it than that. What about you as an individual in your daily life? Have you tried to reach someone by verbally telling them the gospel message? You see, I find for most of us, we're happy to chip 20 bucks in the offering plate for somebody else to do it, but it's different when it's us. And I have found, are you all still with me? Here's what I found. I have found that most church people are only willing for a prospect to have one kind of prospect. The one, one pro, it's the same for everybody. You say, well, what is it? Well, it's different and it's the same. I'll tell you what I mean. For some of us in this room, we're only willing to share the gospel with someone if they don't work with us because we don't want to upset somebody at work. And maybe that's understandable, maybe not. But some of us are only willing to witness to someone if they, if they, if they do work with us because those are the people that we know really well. Some of us will only reach someone for Christ if they're the same color as us. Some of us only if they're not the same color as us, like if we're on a mission trip somewhere. Some of us will only reach someone if they're inside our family, like our own sons and daughters. Some of us will only witness to somebody if they're outside of our family because we don't want to have an upsetting, an upsetting time at Thanksgiving, right? And so we're only willing to witness to certain kinds of people, but one thing's the same for all of us. Most church people in America are only willing to share the gospel with someone when it's comfortable for us to do that, and it almost never is. And so it almost never happens. So we have limited our prospect to a certain kind of person. Now what if the world operated that way? Now Brother BJ says he likes Pepsi. I don't understand that, but let's just go with it. Let's just imagine that when Pepsi-Cola came out with their new product to Pepsi, that frankly, Brother BJ, it t tastes to me like they took uh, Coke's recipe and just added more sugar to it. But, but let's just imagine that they took that new product to Pepsi and after they did all their focus groups, and they, and they shared it around and saw what people thought. They came to the determination, let's just imagine that they came to the determination that only Australian people were going to be interested in Pepsi-Cola. And so as a result, let's imagine they only sold it in Australia. And they only used Australians in their advertising. And they only manufactured it in Australia. Now answer me out loud with a good hearty Sunday night yes or no. If they did that, do you think that Pepsi-Cola would be the multi-billion dollar household name that it is today? No, what do they do? They took that first shot of Pepsi that they got ripped off the recipe from Coke and added more sugar to, and they said, everybody needs a Pepsi. You can't be the wrong color for a Pepsi. You can't live in the wrong place for a Pepsi. You can't speak the wrong language for a Pepsi. Everybody needs a Pepsi. Now here's my question to the, to the cream of the crop Sunday night crowd at, at Corinth Baptist Church in, I think, Darden, Tennessee. I want to ask you something tonight. If they're that excited and that enthusiastic about a silly soft drink, why aren't we that enthusiastic about Jesus who died for us? Amen? Now, I'm going to tell you, these people gave financially because they had to leave. Leave their jobs. Leave their homes. These people in the early church, they had to give financially. They had to give their time. Their whole world was wrapped up in this mission, in this cause. It cost them everything. Because of that, you know what I think? would cause, I really believe this, I, I believe this, what would cause any church, this one included, to be the most spiritual, the most happening, the most growing uh, movement for God anywhere around? You want to know two simple things? Simple things that I think could happen right here in this church or any church that I think would make that church an unstoppable powerhouse for Jesus. Would you like to know what they are? Number one would be, and you'd have to get these things in the majority of your members. Here they are. Number one is tithing. I know it hurts, but write it down as a note. Tithing. And number two is soul winning. Reaching people for Jesus. 
I am utterly convinced that if any church would get in the majority of its members, to, that they would be regular tithers and regularly reaching people for Christ, that church would be unstoppable for Jesus. Not because of the amount of money that you give or the time that you spend, but the very fact that you're willing to do that. Now, I know what you're thinking. Listen, I know Baptists. I know what you're thinking. This is a Baptist church, right? A Baptist church in Darden, I think. And let me tell you what I know about Baptists. I've got a Baptist daddy who's a preacher who you'll meet this week. I've got a Baptist mother. I've got a Baptist wife. And as much as my two daughters whine and cry and complain about everything, I think they're Baptists. And I know Baptists. And you're sitting out there and right now you're thinking, I knew it! I knew it, Brother Don. If we got one of these loud mouth Southern Baptist evangelists in here, he wouldn't make it to Sunday night before he's preaching on money. Well, listen here, you old reprobate. I don't want your money. I'm not preaching. Your tithe wouldn't go to me anyway. Your tithe goes to your church. But I'm not really here principally to preach on money. You know, I mean, I could. I could preach on money. But I'm not going to. Aren't you glad I'm not here to preach on money? Man, I'm not. I, I could. I mean, if I was going to preach on it, which I'm not going to preach on it, but if I was, I'd love to tell you how if you're not giving a dime out of every dollar to the work of God, you're a sorry rascal. But aren't you glad I didn't come to preach on tithing tonight? No, instead I've come to preach on that deeper issue, the issue of soul winning and reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I find in churches that unlike this first uh, church that we have here in Acts chapter 8, most, people are, most churches are concerned about all the other programs in the church more than they are the soul winning program, reaching people for Christ. They're concerned about everything else. Some churches are concerned that the sanctuary is beautiful. And you do have a beautiful sanctuary, don't you? I mean, there's no question. I've thought about it for many years because I think it was about this way when I first came. Just gorgeous sanctuary. Love this sanctuary. That's a beautiful thing and that's important. But for some people, that's the most important thing. For some people, the, 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 the church nursery is the most important thing. And I, I, listen, that's important, isn't it? We've got to have a good church nursery. I mean, come on now. And, and I'm a father. I understand that. And we've got to have the right people in there. Somebody's got to watch those little smelly bottomed ankle biters. I mean, that, there's something to that. And, and then there are some people who the music is the most important program. And, oh, brother, do we have a problem with that in churches today. Do you know with what I do, I principally talk to atheists and agnostics. That's primarily what I do in, in, when, I'm, when I'm doing stuff, evangelism and things. And, um, and, and you can go to my YouTube channel where I, where I do those things. And, and it's just atheists everywhere hanging off my earlobes saying the most blasphemous things. And then I go in church and they're arguing about the silliest of things, what kind of music they think God likes the best. I mean, I go to some churches to preach, and on, I'm on a rabbit trail, but listen, I'm a Southern Baptist evangelist. I get three of those per sermon. That's just part of the territory. But I go to some churches, and they start out with a, a traditional service at 8.30, and then they come back at 10. You've got a blended service, and then at 11.30, you've got a, a, a contemporary service. And if you come back at 1 o'clock after lunch, you get a country western service. And I just think when we get to heaven, we're going to have one service before the throne of God, all of us together, and we're going to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I should have said that this morning. It had gone a lot better this morning. Um, <laughs> wake up, folks. But, but the point is, we're concerned about all these other things, but the thing that matters the most to God is the soul winning program. Seeing people get saved. Are you willing... To do that, are you willing to be a person who reaches others? You say, why are you preaching to us so hard like this? Don't you know we're a good church? You are, you're a good church. I love this church. This is a wonderful church. This is an exceptional church. But, I mean, if, if we're looking at primarily a church crowd tonight, I believe this is one of the things we can do that will absolutely bring revival. You know, um, I, when I was pastoring in McMinnville, Tennessee, where he's talking about, um, I, uh, I was willing to do whatever it took to see someone come to know Jesus. I'm not bragging on myself, but especially when I was in my early 20s and there, and, and, and I was bold and all that, and I, listen, I would do whatever it took so long as it was not unbiblical or immoral. I'd do whatever it took to see someone come to know Jesus. My dad did too. You can ask him about this. When he pastored in the same town, a different church, uh, about uh, 20 years before that, he, was, he, uh, he, uh, he did one time, he said, you, come, you get enough people to come to church, and I will jump off a 60-foot pole. And he did. He laid a pole long ways on the ground, jumped off of it. But I mean, he, I, I'll do whatever it took. And so there was these two guys in our church named Bryant and Kyle. And Bryant and Kyle would always sit right down here on the front row. They were the same age as me. Their wives were involved in just everything the church was doing. I mean, they were some of the finest people in our church ever were. But they weren't members of our church. 
And I thought that was kind of important because, you know, the, the fact is, I want, you got churches in town. I want to know, who, who am I responsible for? Who, who, who's going to work with us at the church to do what God's doing at our church? And so I wanted them to become members in our church. And so I said, what have I got to do to get you? You come all the time. You're right on the front row. You're taking notes. Your wife, what have I got to do to get you guys to join? And they said, well, they said, here's the thing. They said, we want to know that wherever we become members, that, that we've got a pastor who's really enthusiastic and excited and passionate about the gospel. And I said, man, you don't get any more enthusiastic and passionate than me. And they said, well, prove it to us. I said, how am I going to prove it to you? They said, well, we, we, they thought for a minute. They said, well, we, we like to go kayaking. Now, do y'all Dardinians know what kayaks are? I guess Dardinians is how you say it. That's what I'm going with. And they said, uh, we're gonna go, we like to go kayaking, and we're going to go kayaking this uh, coming Saturday, and if you'll go kayaking with us, then we'll join your church on Sunday. And I thought that over, and I thought, is it unbiblical? No. Is it immoral? No. And I said, I'm in. Let's do it. So we got down there. Now, on Friday night, it had flum a cud in McMinnville, Tennessee. Now, see, y'all are laughing. When I say that where I live, they don't know what in the world I'm talking about. But it, was, it had rained so bad that the river was flooded, and uh, it's probably going 100 miles an hour or something. But here's the key. It was, it was in February, and it was below freezing temperatures. And here these three idiots are going to go out and get into a kayak. And I know you shouldn't say idiot in church, but it's Sunday night, and come on. And so we three idiots got into these kayaks. Now they told me, they said, there's one thing you need to know. It is impossible. It's just a thing about kayaks that's different than a canoe. It is impossible to tip over and completely fall out of a kayak. Now listen, you Dardinians, I want you to know, don't believe anyone tells you any nonsense like that. None of us were in our kayaks for more than 30 seconds. The first fella fell out, and he was half unconscious, hit his head on a log, and was floating down the river. He finally came to and grabbed on a tree like a drowned cat. The other guy, Brian, he was underneath the water, and he was trying to survive, and y'all are laughing and everything, but his poor pregnant wife, and he nearly died that day, but he survived, don't worry. And then I was doing the most heroic thing, just like you would all imagine I would be doing. I was swimming for shore to save myself. <laughs> and about the time I got up out of the river, I heard sirens. And it, it came to my attention that someone had called the emergency services and told about these lunatics. And, and in fact, we ended up on, on the front page of the city paper uh, the next day. We were four columns wide on the front page and they talked about us on the news. They didn't show it, but they talked about us in Knoxville, Chattanooga, Nashville, and Memphis. And, um, and so, so but, but before I knew all of that, I knew the services were there and I thought, what am I going to do? Because here came two fire trucks, three ambulances, one for each one of us. And I don't know how many police cars, state, county, here they all came. And so I thought I concocted something because I've only been in this church a year and I thought they're going to fire me over this. And so I thought, I'll, I'll do something we Baptists are good at. I'm not going to lie to them, but I took the truth and I bent it all out of shape. <laughs> See, my name is Christopher Braxton Hunter, but I go by Braxton. So I thought, I'll tell them my name is Chris Hunter. They'll never put it together that I'm Christopher Braxton Hunter, the pastor of Cornerstone Baptist Church. But little did I know that my buddy who was half unconscious out here on the tree was now being shoveled off into an emergency rescue police boat and he was going on in his delirium about how he was out there with Christopher Braxton Hunter, the pastor of Cornerstone Baptist Church, 49 Golf Club Road, McMinnville, Tennessee. And what was worse, this is what was required to become a member in our fellowship. Now that, that last bit, I made that part up, okay? I just, I just, when I make something up, I'll tell you. But it just felt like it needed to be there. So, but anyway, so I, I thought to myself, I thought, what am I going to do? Because the news media arrived, and they wanted me to make a statement. And so uh, I thought, okay, what am I going to do? So I called my dad. Dad told me what to do. And I was thinking to myself, how can I use this opportunity to see people come to know Jesus? You say, you weren't thinking that. You're just trying to sound spiritual. No, I was thinking that, but I'll admit it was more about job security at this point. But I, but, I, but I said this. I said, okay. I said, here it is. You want a statement? Here it is. Here's a statement. I make no statement at present, but there will be a press conference tomorrow morning at precisely 1030 at Cornerstone Baptist Church. All are invited to attend. And so on Sunday morning, man, we had a crowd in there like you wouldn't believe. They were lined up and down the aisles. They were hanging out the windows. They were everywhere. And so I sat up on stage, and I stood out of the way. I didn't want anybody to see me until it was time for me to preach. And when it was time for me to preach, I didn't realize they had one song left. And as I came out on stage, they played the song. And the song, as I live and die, I'm not making it up, the song was, Step into the water, tread out a little bit deeper. Now you say, what's the point of all of that? Here's the point. 
everyone who was on that emergency services crew, whether they were a firefighter, EMT, police, whatever, all of them and a lot of other people came to our church that day or in subsequent services. And the ones that were saved but didn't have a church home found a church home. And the ones that were saved but weren't right with God got, with, got right with God. And the ones that weren't saved got saved. Now, do you want to know why that happened? Do you want to know why it came into my mind to do that? You say, well, it's, it's because, you know, it's because you're a preacher and you're supposed to think that way. No, that's not it. You say, well, it's because you've been to Bible college. In Bible college, they teach those sort of things. No, no, no. They, no. they do not teach kayak evangelism at Bible college. <laughs> Although, I'll tell you, as a church growth strategy, I've got an idea. Next time it comes a flood around here, you get Brother Don out into a kayak and we'll see what happens, all right? Who would vote for that? Raise your hands. All right, we got a quorum here tonight. But, um, but, but no, it wasn't because of that. You say, well, it's because you're so brilliant and, and scholarly. and all. Well, Let's not take that off the table. That might have had something to do with it. But no, I'll tell you why it was. I try to think, and I'm not bragging on myself because I've got plenty of flaws that are none of your business again, but I've got plenty of flaws. But the fact of the matter is, I try to think of the big and small events in my life as opportunities to see people who don't know Jesus come to know Jesus, not just when I'm on the clock in Parsons or Darden, Tennessee, but when I'm at home. I try to think, how can I see people get saved? Not because I'm an evangelist, not because I'm a preacher, but because just like every person who professes Christ in this room, I'm a Christian, and that's what Christians are supposed to do. And we've been laughing, but I want to tell you, I believe if you're not doing that, then we're going to have to answer for that one day. There are people that will be in hell one day that we could have tried to reach. We couldn't make them get saved. We could try to reach them. Look at verse 12. I want to show you something else. Look down at verse 12. When you get there, say amen. Well, what's wrong with you? It's the same page in my Bible. <laughs> but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now stop right there and look this way. Are you still listening? Say, we're still listening. You know, I'm just going to tell you, I will confess something tonight. I don't know how y'all feel, but I haven't preached in a couple of weeks, and I'm just having fun. I hope y'all are having fun tonight. Man, it feels like revival could break loose. I hope y'all feel that way. But they came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Every good salesperson, oh, by the way, don't worry, my next two points are a lot shorter than my first point. That was a long first point, and I know that. But every good salesperson and every believer has to have a prospect. But every good salesperson and every believer has also got a product. A product. Now, you got, if you've got people you're trying to reach with something, you ought to have something you're trying to reach them with. Now, what is our product? Our product is the gospel message. That's what we're trying to reach people with. But you know something interesting in this passage? You know, it says, when Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word, they received the message, the gospel message. But what was the key ingredient? The Holy Spirit of God was the key ingredient. You know, I'll tell you, there are people that believe that they ought to be reaching others, and some of you here tonight, you're in that boat. You say, I know I'm supposed to be reaching people, but I don't know how, Brother Braxton. I've never been to a class that teaches me how to share my faith. I'm, I'm, not, a good, I'm not very good at that. Can I, can I tell you, folks, the wonderful thing about the gospel message is that if you're just willing to tell people who Jesus is and what He did for you, the Holy Spirit will do the rest. The Holy Spirit does all the work. And that means we've got an advantage with our product. It's not like the products of the world. You know, the products of the world, they have to use slogans and billboards. and You know, we have that stuff in the church too, and I think it's great. If you've got t Christian t I think that's great. Although if you're one of those people that puts the fish on your car... Just be careful how you drive because you're representing that fish. I just want you to know. But we don't have to have that stuff to share our faith. Those things are great, but we don't have to have them. The world's got to have that to convince people. You know, um, Doritos says, you know you want one. You show them Jesus, they'll know they want him. Pringles says, once you pop, you can't stop. You show them Jesus, they won't be able to stop him. Sprite says, obey your thirst. I think we really need some Christians in Darden who will obey their God. Nivea says, protect your skin. Jesus will protect your soul. Kodak, back when it was relevant, used to say, share moments, share life. Well, when you're sharing Jesus, you're really sharing life. And I've learned over the past 11 years that Pampers is behind me every step of the way. Well, thank God they're not the only ones. And thank God that the joy of BJ's Pepsi is nothing compared to the joy of the Lord. Amen. 
You say, yeah, but Brother Braxton, I can't share my faith. Well, why not? Well, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm backwards. I'm shy. I'm, 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 I'm an introvert. Let me confess something else to you tonight. And you won't believe it. But in high school, I was an introvert. In fact, technically, I probably still am. But you know that thing that people say, God doesn't call the qualified, He qualifies those He calls? That may be cliche, but it's actually true. And even though I was just in the background in high school and I was not one of the popular kids, I finally learned that God's more powerful than I am and He can do things through me that I didn't expect. And tonight, just look at me go. But you know, it, it, you can't use that excuse. Listen, you're called to, to the gospel. You say, yeah, but Brother Braxton, I can't preach the gospel. Well, why not? Well, because I'm a woman. You know what you narrow-minded Southern Baptists think about women preachers. Well, I'm not going to touch that one. I praise God I've heard that your pastor is going to cover that topic next Sunday for service. <laughs> we'll put that one to a vote just like the kayak. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. Whether you think that you're qualified to or capable to or the right gender to or whatever, whatever you want to put on that to stand in a pulpit and preach the gospel like I'm preaching it right now, I can tell you what, to preach merely means to proclaim the truth. And whether you do that in an official capacity in a church, you can still preach the gospel to other people no matter what you are. You say, yeah, but, but Brother Braxton, I just, I just don't know. I mean, people might get upset. You're right, they might get upset. You might have doors slammed in your face. You might have people get mad that you're sharing. And our job shouldn't be, we shouldn't intend to upset people, right? I mean, there's some preachers I see on TV and it looks like the way they're preaching, like they got out of the bed in the morning and thought, who can I tick off with the gospel today? I don't think that's how we ought to be, but you know what? The Bible does describe itself as a sword, which is an offensive weapon, and it may upset some people, despite your best efforts. But you know, the, the Bible never promised us it would be all blue skies and green pastures. That's not what it's about. The thing is, we get to know the King of Kings, and we have the promise of heaven, and seeing those loved ones that have passed on again one day, and being forever in that kingdom. And I really believe all that stuff is real, like this podium is real tonight. And it's worth it. But you know, it's not always going to be rosy. You know, church, church nurseries, will y'all give me two more minutes? How many of y'all give me two more minutes? Would you just raise your hand? Two, four, six, eight, we're good. Okay, um, man, that's cheesy, isn't it? I, there's been at least two cheesy preacher jokes um, for those keeping track. But you know, I've found every church I go into, the church nursery has decorations. And oftentimes, somewhere, there will be Noah's Ark decorations. I haven't checked out your church nursery. I don't know. You might be the exception. But most of the time, there's Noah's Ark. And Noah's Ark is a pretty picture in the nursery. I mean, for these kids, you know it ought to be. It's kind of like a Disney thing. You got, there's, there's not a drop of rain in the sky. The sky is blue. There's white puffy clouds. There's a boat that looks like about the size of a Nerf football. Wouldn't hold a colony of ants, but there it is holding every animal. And you got, everybody's got a smile on their face. You know, Papa Noah's out here on the front, and he's looking out at the world. He's got a big white puffy beard and rosy red cheeks. Looks like Santa Claus and Robert Redford all wrapped up into one gorgeous man. And he's smiling. He's so glad to be on that ark. He's looking out like he's ready to set the world on fire. And Mama Noah is out here in the middle, and she's looking at Papa Noah, and she's smiling. And she's got, and this always, I think this is a bit sexist, frankly, but she's got valentines around her head as she's looking out at Papa Noah. And, and yeah, I mean, because she's a woman, she's got to be in love, right? And after all, that's exactly where any woman would want to be out there on an ark shoveling manure off the side of an ark every day. And then there's the, everybody smiling, the rainbow shooting everywhere, and there's a big old goofy, goofy giraffe just looking around smiling at everything. And it looks like such a happy picture. But if you go to the book of Genesis, chapter 6 and on to about the end of chapter 9, is that what, the, is that what Noah's ark was like? Now, I mean, don't take those decorations down if you've got them. I mean, the kids need to learn the Bible. But, but, I mean, the Bible gives us a picture of Noah's Ark. It was a miserable place. Everything that they'd ever known, every place that was special to their family, was now wiped away by the judgment of God. And the only joy that Noah had was the joy that he was doing, ultimately, at least he was doing what God wanted him to do. And he was where God wanted him to be. You know, I'll tell you something. You may not always have blue skies and green pastures, you may upset some people. But at least you're serving God. The God who honored you with that opportunity. The reason you have this Bible is because people were willing to go for their deaths in the early church to make sure you could have it 2,000 years later. 
Let's not dishonor them. Now, I want to say one final thing, and I promise I'll leave you alone and go back to Parsons. But I want you to look, um, look down at verse 24. Verse 25. Look at verse 25. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, at the beginning of verse 25, it says, And they, when they had what? Do you know that everybody in this room who's saved has got a sermon that's all your own? Every good salesperson and every believer has got to have prospects, has got to have a product, and has also got to have a presentation. Did you know that, um, that every believer has got a presentation? You've got a sermon that is unique to you. What is it? It's your testimony. That's what these guys did. They went and testified. That's your testimony. And do you know it's got your sermon that is unique to you, has got everything that we teach in Bible college a good sermon ought to have. It's got Jesus. If it doesn't have Jesus, you don't have one. It's got Jesus. It's got Scripture, John 3.16, if nothing else. It's, it's got stories, the story of what happened in your life. It's your testimony. And if you don't know the joy of sharing your testimony with someone and seeing them become transformed from a person who was on their way to hell without Jesus to a person who's on their way to heaven with Jesus, you don't know one of the greatest joys of the Christian life. You know, I want to tell you, there's a lot going on in our culture right now, isn't there? You know, there's people that, that, that there's, that, and I'm not preaching a political message because the things I'm mentioning, I don't think are political issues. They're just issues, they're moral issues that have been politicized. We've got issues with abortion. We've got issues of confusion regarding gender and sexuality. And my heart goes out to people that are struggling with all those things. But do you know what actually, I, I'm not against people protesting and that's an American thing and all that. I get that and that's great. But you know what does better for America than all the politicking? And, and, and I'm not saying those are bad things. You know what does more than all those things? Reaching someone with the gospel message. That is the most powerful thing. And if you don't know that joy, you don't know what living is all about or what it can be in the Christian life. Now, um, before I close, let me say something. If you're here tonight, and there's a chance you don't know Jesus, don't tune me out. Then nothing I've said tonight really ultimately matters to you because I've been preaching to the church. But can I tell you, I believe there are people that need Jesus at every service, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm an evangelist, and I don't believe that God would have laid it on my heart to come or the pastor's heart to ask me come, but there are people that need Jesus in these services. Now, I can't prove it. You may all be saved. But I want to remind you that filling out a card in a church doesn't make you saved. Coming to the front doesn't make you saved. Getting baptized doesn't make you saved. Coming to know Jesus is what makes you saved. And if you're here tonight, and you're not 100% settled on that, can I tell you, don't wait another day. You say, well, Brother Braxton, why? You're going to say it's because there's heaven and hell on the line? You better believe it. I believe there's a place called hell, like I said this morning, and I'll make you a deal. If you could promise me that you're not going to walk out of these doors at the end of this service, get in your car and collide with a Mack truck sending you out into eternity, I wouldn't preach this hard, but you know what? You can't promise me that. If you could promise me that you're not going to have a sheet pulled over your head before the night is done, and they've said, the paramedics have said, we've done all for him, we've done all for her that we can, then I won't preach this way, but you can't promise me that. If you can promise me that the Lord is not about to return, I wouldn't preach this way, but you can't promise me that. Friend, heaven and hell is on the line. It's forever. There is no end to it. It's forever and ever and ever and ever. And if you're here tonight and there's the slightest concern that if you died, you don't know Jesus, don't you leave here tonight without making it right. Because Jesus died on an old rugged cross to take your place. So you could be saved if you but repent and trust in him. Would you bow your heads with me all over this place? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody looking around. With our heads bowed, listen, don't tune me out. Come on now, don't mess with your phone, don't mess with your purse. Just listen for a second. If you're here tonight and you'd say, you know what, Brother Braxton? I know I'm saved. Then I want you that know that you're saved to pray this prayer with me silently. This is different from what we did this morning. But I want you to pray silently with, silently with me this prayer. And we're going to ask God to show us who it is in our lives that may or may not be saved, but we haven't taken the time to find out. With your head bowed and eyes closed, would you just pray with me this prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, show me right now who it is that I have failed to try and reach for you. Bring them to the forefront of my mind. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, you might say, yeah, but Brother Braxton, I don't know anybody that's lost. There's lost people everywhere. What about that young man that mows your lawn or that lady that does your taxes? What about that friend at school? What about that person that brought you write your name down at the doctor's office? 
There's lost people everywhere. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if God just laid someone or several someones on your heart who may or may not be saved, but you've never really taken the time to find out, listen, don't be ashamed. That's been all of us at one time or another. But as I said this morning, we can't have a movement of God in Darden if we're not willing to be honest with ourselves about where we are. If that's you, I'm not going to have you raise your hand. But if God laid someone or several someones on your heart, would you just on the count of three, when I count three out loud, would you just look up at me and lock eyes with me and then look right back down? One, here we go. Two, get ready. Three, just look up at me if that's you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bow your heads. And with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want you to listen. Everyone listen like you've never listened to a preacher before. If you're here and you'd say, Brother Braxton, I know it's Sunday night. But if I'm honest, I don't know for sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. There is a question mark there. Listen, I'm, I don't want to hear all the religious talk. Let's just be honest. If you don't know for sure, you need to get it settled tonight. Because I do believe heaven and hell's on the line. With your heads bowed, nice closed. If you say, Brother Braxton, I'm not sure where I stand on that. Nobody looking around on the count of three. I just want you to look up and lock eyes with me if that's you. One, here we go. Two, get ready. Three, just look up at me if that's you. Anybody in this place? All right, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want everyone all at once to look up this way and listen to me. In a moment, we're going to stand and, and we're going to sing. And the moment that we stand to sing, here's what I want you to do. This is the first night of a week of evening services. And we're going to have two evangelists. And I want to tell you something. I believe that a week-long service like that, listen, there is no doubt that God could turn this town upside down. And Parsons and Lexington. So here, here's what I'm begging you. I can't thank you, but here's what I'm begging you. You that have someone on your heart, when we stand up and sing in a moment, would you just come and stand with me at the front? And here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray over those people and ones like them that we'll see a great harvest this week. And uh, I believe that God will honor that. And, and if you're out there and you didn't want to look up at me, but you'd say, Brother Braxton, I'm not saved, you come as well. And this is your time. Let's stand. Let's sing. And quickly, right now, just come. Quickly. Quickly, right now. Quickly. for us, sister. Folks, listen to me. Um, in a moment, we're going to bow our heads and we're going to pray over these people. I realize that for some of you out there in the crowd, you'd say, Brother Braxton, I didn't come forward. But that doesn't mean there's someone in my life who's not lost. And I, 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 But I have tried to reach them. You just pray with us as we pray for these people. But, but also, when we bow our heads in a moment, if you're out there and you'd say, Brother Braxton, I'm a young person, I'm an old person, whatever it may be, but I don't know Jesus, or I don't know that I do, but I just couldn't come forward. Listen, when we bow our heads, you just come on forward. The preacher's right down here in the middle. Just go right up to him and say, I'm not sure about what would happen if I died. He'd love to talk to you about that. He'd love to talk to you about that. Let's bow our heads all over this place, and I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to lead you in prayer, and I just want you to think of these people that are on your heart as we pray together but I want us to be united and in agreement on this so let's pray together and what we're going to pray I'm not going to lead you in some blind prayer we're going to pray together and we're going to ask God to forgive us for not reaching people like we should I've had to do that at times but we're also going to pray that he would give us the courage to be that kind of person a soul winner and that this particular person or these particular people would become Christians very soon even this week let's pray together dear Lord Jesus thank you for saving me and I'm sorry for the time that I've wasted. But the best I know how, from this day forward, I'll be a soul winner for you. And I pray for 
the person that you put on my heart. I pray for the people you put on my heart. That you give me the courage to reach them. And I pray that they be saved very soon. I pray they be saved this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Is that what's on your heart, folks? Is that what's on your heart? If it is, I believe we're going to see one of the biggest movements that Darden or Parsons or Lexington or wherever I'm at right now has ever seen. Um, and, and I believe we're going to see that happen. Now, here's what you do. Especially you that are at the front, but everyone, I want you to tonight, if you can, text people, call people, Facebook people, tweet at people, whatever you want to do, and say to them, if my love for you means anything, will you just come with me to church this week? Um, if you're a dude, you can say, if my friendship with you means anything, will you just come with me this week to church? Listen, my dad's going to come, and I'm going to steal one of his stories away from him. My dad had a woman come to church one night at a revival, old lady. There are no old ladies here, y'all, young and beautiful and vibrant. But an older lady came up, little lady, and tugged on his sleeve. And he looked down and she said, I want you to know, are you the preacher? He said, yeah. She said, I hate you. He said, why do you hate me? She said, because I'm Catholic. My daughter invited me to go to a bingo game tonight. And up we rolled at this church. And I don't want to be here and I don't like you and I hate you. And he said, well, thank you, darling. She went and sat down. At the end of the service, he felt the same tug on his sleeve. He looked down and she said, you remember me? He said, honey, I ain't never going to forget you. She said, well, I got saved tonight, but I still hate you. And he said, well, ma'am, if you got saved, you're not allowed to hate me anymore. She said, I'll make a deal with you. I've got two more daughters at home. And tomorrow night, I'm going to invite them to a bingo game. And if they get saved, I might like you a little bit. Now, I don't want you to lie to anybody, but that's the spirit we're going for, all right? So uh, I thank God for you all. If you need to pray at the altar, you can, or you can talk to the pastor. You can go on back to your pew. I don't want to, uh, to hinder what's going on. But let's pray together tonight as people move back to their pews and we're about to close. Let's pray that God will move this week. Father, I pray that, you, that we would see a great harvest this week, that this area would just become a place known for revival, that we would see revival that would have to go three and four weeks and longer because something is really happening. It's not a scheduled revival, but people are truly being saved. If there's anyone in this place with your heads bowed and eyes closed, last chance that would say, Brother Braxton, I don't know for sure. And I want to know what would happen if I died. I want to know Jesus. Anyone in this place like that, would you put your hand up right now? I just don't know for sure. Anybody? All right. All right. And everyone look this way. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to the pastor now. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night, we're going to have more beautiful piano playing. And sister, that's been beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, hadn't the song leader done a great job today? Hasn't he just done fantastic, too? And, um, and uh, that's Brother BJ. He drinks Pepsi. And, um, and I'll tell you what, tomorrow night, I'm going to preach a message. You know, Monday night is tradition. I don't know what it's like in this town. I don't remember. Monday night is traditionally a little low. Um, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow night, but I'll tell you what, if there's lost people here, I'm going to preach to lost people. If there's saved people here, I'm sure going to preach to saved people. And uh, I believe we're going to see the beginning of something great. I believe we can feel a great rumbling of revival in this place. And we're not going to let the weather stand in the way. So thank you all so much. And um, I, I just, I'm excited to come back and see you again. Pastor, I turn it over to you. Amen. We've had a great time tonight, right? We've had a good challenge for us. So we've got our work cut up for us. Uh, the person that's on your mind, it may be somebody that's a little more bit hurt. You do wake them up.
See you in the morning at 11. Tomorrow evening.